I had been indoctrinated in Newtonian way of thinking. There were equations, and you solved them tuka, 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 from initial conditions and on. It never occurred to me to question any of that. Do you believe that clouds are supercomputers in the sky? That they solve partial differential equations? Do you think that's how they do it? Integrate them forward in time, tuk, 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 tuk. The resounding answer is no. Do they obey Navier-Stokes equation? Yes. But the way they do it is they satisfy them locally, everywhere and for all times. A few words about turbulence. Our challenge is to use Navier-Stokes equations to describe the turbulence in a way that things that we see in the skies, the shapes, the patterns, we use as a building blocks from which we can describe turbulence. The goal is to start from the equations and make no statistical assumptions. Is the time to do that now? Yes, because experiments have just become amazing. And what we can now see in turbulence, we can see the behavior of the fluid with precision that the naked eye often cannot distinguish from computer simulations. So we have to do three-dimensional turbulence because that's the world in which our plumbers work. But for this talk, it's a little bit too difficult because we lack the power of visualizing a three-dimensional vector field at every point of a three-dimensional volume. Tradition in this field is that one of the starting points is to try to develop intuition, not in three dimensions, but one spatial dimension and one time dimension. kuramoto shivashinsky equations. The way they work is you record how fast the flame front is going up or down. And the way you do this is at every point you use a color scale. And this is space and Tradition in the subject is to be able to put it on a computer to limit the size. And now your computer produces the flame front at every later time, so this is time going up. And what you see from simulations is that it flutters and it never settles. And so as far as we can tell, this is chaotic. When we look at simulation of turbulence in three dimensions, so here is a beautiful simulation by Mark Avila, you can visualize your numerical simulation also in three dimensions. You see various structures. And one of the things that you always see in turbulent systems, and that's what they share with our experience of clouds, is that every so often we seem to see a similar thing. Now, the theory of turbulent flows that a group of people has developed over 20, 30 years is very good in describing what happens in a short part of the tube. So one of the questions is this, if you really understand what happens in a small areas, can we put that together as little blocks and from it build turbulence? What mathematics we need for this? How would they do this? What would the blocks look like? We can do this, Matt Gudorf has done this. He found that there are very few small little blocks. He has shown that you can use these little tiles, here they are. You can stick them next to each other to get an approximate pattern of time evolution of some spatial region. You can start with this and you can kind of shake it, stretch it, let your computer glue it together, and you get arbitrarily accurate solution of kuramoto Shivashinsky that has that shape that's given by your little tiles. That says that these patterns, we might be able to glue them together from small videos. These are not snapshots of clouds, but these are sequences of how regions of the clouds develop because vertical axis here is time, we can give names to these tiles that we have. And the way this is done, it's taking the local things that are consistent with Kuramoto Shivashinsky, that's how we constructed them. And then they have to talk to their neighbors 
left and right in this case in one dimension. In three dimension, we're left, right, back, front, up, down. And then they also have to agree with their neighbors that preceded them and that come after them in time. So that was a little bit about turbulence. And here is a surprising thought that the way to think about it is to make space behave like another version of time. So what we traditionally do, we integrate equations for fluids forward in time. To be able to put it on computer, we make space finite. But it's quite possible to, instead of going forward in time, integrate a partial differential equation that describes turbulence going sideways, meaning in space. Treat the spatial direct like you treat time. So you have a change in time equals some nonlinear function on the right hand side. And to make this possible, now you have to make time compact. So what we do is we make we put time on a circle. And you can do it. So here is on the left hand side, Matt takes Kuramoto Shivashinsky on some spatial domain. He integrates it and he finds a solution. Or he takes instant in space, all values in time, and integrates it from the left to right in this picture. And he produces the same solution, either treating time as time or treating space as time. So it's possible to do that. But it's very unstable computation, very difficult, and it's easy to understand why it's unstable. The same thing happens in three-dimensional fluid turbulence. So while we can do integrations of fluid turbulence, we've hit the wall. We have found that if, as our volumes of fluid get a little bit too big compared to the structure that you see here, our computers just die out. They can't do it because it's all too unstable. So what do we do? The usual way of thinking about Newtonian way, taka 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 in time, or maybe taka 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 in space, is not working. Let's rethink this whole thing. The answer, I believe, is forget Newton. Build a theory from the simplest chaotic blocks I've shown you, using the ideas that uh, the laws are the same every place in space and time. You know, these are the typical assumptions we make about laws of nature. We don't want to change them during the week, and we certainly don't want them to be different in Kyoto from Alpha Centauri. When we solve uh, Kuramoto Shivashinsky flame front on a Bunsen burner, we put it on a circle, and we say, well, where you're on a circle is not important, so there's translational invariance. Whenever you have translation invariance, it means that you should do a Fourier transform and work in Fourier modes, which are the natural modes for anything that's translation invariant. So this equation becomes equation for Fourier modes. The spatial derivatives become diagonal and there are nonlinear terms. And that's how we, so we actually saw Kuramoto Shevashinsky. We have turned this problem on a lot is because we take finite number of points of the circle and then do the best calculation we can do on a computer. What we are really doing is we are taking a little ring this finite number of points, and we're going tuck, 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 finite times the space. So we actually live on a discrete lattice, which is space-time lattice. It's a cylinder because space is compact, but we let time run forever. There is a price because it's very unstable. So after the moon of horizon, we have lost all information, but that's what we do. I can also compactify time, and I can run in space. That's also legal. The thing that we really need to do is we have to produce natural compact solutions, you know, finite solutions that describe the things that we see. And my claim is that what you want to do in this particular case is you want to compactify both space and time and find solution on two tori or d tori in uh, higher dimensions. The way to do is you have points on your fish stocking that's covering your donut because it's translational and we're in two directions. You do two, take two Fourier transform, one in time, other ones in space. And the moment you do this, time is gone away, space is gone away. We're, you're living on what's called reciprocal lattice on a dual space. The thing that you're solving is actually an algebraic problem and you're trying to find fixed points, fields satisfy the equation side by side. So this is the local part of this thing. Now notice there is no 
integration in time. There's no integration in space and nothing is exploding exponentially when you do this. You're solving a different kind of problem. So every calculation that we actually do is a lattice calculation on a compact lattice. If you're using the laws of nature, it should be translational invariant because it should be true every place and that's what we do. So there is no time, there's no space. There is a global field. Locally, it has to satisfy this equation. So there's a high dimensional condition, which is a fixed point condition. And what this local equation says that at every point I have to be nice to my neighbor and I have to follow whatever the law is. And if we all do this, we will be doing a perfect thing. So that's how NYCHA does it. The solution of Navier-Stokes or Kuramoto Shivashinsky or general relativity or uh, Young Mills or whatever makes you happy, says that on your space or space-time, there's some field or set of fields and locally they have to be nice. So locally they follow this differential equation which we inherited from Newton, but Globally, they have to all live in harmony. I'll say this three times and what's wrong with what I've told you today? It's a complicated thing. You don't want to run a computer and solve never Stokes. Can I give you a simple pencil and paper example? Yes. That's how we teach chaos also in one dimension. Now we'll teach you chaotic field theory. So we'll do this by looking at cat map and I'll show that it immediately generalizes into the field theory. I will want you to think of space-time as lots of neighborhoods and on each there is a cat. They all want to run away because they're cats, but they have to do it in agreement with their neighbors. Now I'll explain why it's called cats. First by doing this cat map. So it's an evolution in time. It has physical origins, you know, you have electrons circling in atom. You can imagine it's a classical electron charged particle and every unit time externally, you kick it. So that gives you discrete time and that reduces a motion on a circle to a bunch of successive times integer space. That's called standard map and it's Hamiltonian formulation. Velocity is momentum and acceleration is the force exerted and beautiful things come out of this. The simplest example of this is if you assume that force follows Hooke's law, it's proportional to how hard I push. Then this is a linear system matrix acting on these variables. So this is a beautiful thing to teach people chaos when you have mechanics, no dissipation. If this parameter S is larger than two, you push and instead of behaving like the springs behave, you push and that pushes back. You push and it behaves like a cat, it just runs away. So there are two regimes. If stretching is weak then hook rules, the thing just oscillates. If stretching is strong, then everybody runs away. And to make sure that, that all the cats don't disappear, so you make sure that they live on a donut. So when they run away, they have to reappear because there is a compact space they can live in. So that's where cat lives. So if you want to understand chaos, when you're discussing order, harmonic oscillator is what we teach always, you know, how the clocks work, they're very orderly. If you want to teach chaos, you teach them cat. They are wild sisters of each other. They're the most fundamental ways of explaining your theory. Everything I'm telling you now, you can do by hand. That's the traditional cat, but the modern field theorist cat should be on a lattice. The lattice now is instant in time. So you have to get the idea that space and time are equally good. And modern cat lives on this lattice because you look at it only at integer time. That means I can replace velocity by distance between two fields at two consecutive time instants divided by instants in time. And we can rewrite this equation as a two-step difference equation on a lattice. That's much more beautiful than original cat map. This was done by Percival Vivaldi. 87, the earliest I've learned it. 
And what it says is, I am a cat. I sit at instant time T, and I have to be mindful of my predecessors and that cat that will follow me. And I want to leave, so I get stretched by this factor S. So that's very simple dynamics. And on the right-hand side is something that uh, physicists like to call sources. That's how cat works in the modern times. So now temporal cat says at every neighborhood, I have to follow the law. This is the law, but I have to do it every place. So I construct all the states on the lattice. I make it finite and sites. That's a vector with n components. I get m instructions what I'm supposed to do. This is you know coming from outside and it's forcing me to do stuff. I have a state, I multiply it because it's a linear problem by some matrix. And that has to follow the orders. This matrix is very important. It's called Orbit Jacobian matrix. To find allowed configurations of fields on some compact domain, I have to solve a fixed point condition, meaning uh, I'm on a large dimensional space and I have to make sure that law is followed and that can be written as law equals zero. To do this, I have to evaluate the first derivative of that. That's how we usually solve these problems, Newton math. And that derivative is now called orbit Jacobian matrix. It's a stability of the whole orbit. If I perturb it at any site, it's described by this matrix. What does it do? It has a very good pedigree uh, from 1886. Its determinant is famous, it's called Hill determinant. It says that when I compute these determinants of volumes, uh, interpretation of this volume is that if I have some solution, I perturb it, its neighborhood in which the solution is recognizable and not perturbed beyond any recognition, its size is one over determinant. We know what it means to evolve an error in time. We perturb initial condition, then time Jacobian matrix. And after one period, we obtain a Floquet matrix, which describes how the neighborhoods deform in time. When you look at orbit Jacobian, you kick every point along the orbit. So what is the relation between this very big matrix and the little matrix of initial perturbation involving time? That was answered by Hill. Hill's formula says, that the determinant of the homogous orbit matrix is the same thing as 1 minus Jacobian of the time evolution because it's a very small matrix. This has some unexpected consequences. As space equals time, you're allowed to evolve in space. Because of the Hills formula, these two determinants perform the same computation. Very cute, has been noticed by people who do many body quantum chaos. And then there are some beautiful results that if you add up all neighborhoods, you get one. What it means is that all possible states of the system are divided in neighborhoods and each neighborhood certain side, and that's done by Hill determinant. So in 20th century, you used to teach them chaos forward in time. You would say, well, you know, Lyapunov is how the neighbors on average depart from each other when you have unstable systems. And entropy is this thing with cats. In how many ways can the cat run away and come back? And you count those ways, take a logarithm, that's called entropy, and that's meaning of deterministic chaos. Now, this field theory version says, I have to check where heel determinants are expanding. So these things are growing as I get larger and larger uh, periodic domain, and that will generalize to many dimensions, not just one. And then I have to count how many possible solutions there are to this condition. These two things do the same job as positive Lyapunov and entropy, but they don't mention time at all. So they work in space time. To summarize, you have to think globally, but you have to act locally. You have to, to find what shapes can clouds have you will have to find fixed point condition and for domains that are finite and compact, you'll enumerate all possible clouds that can sit on that shape. 
what that means is that instead of looking at something that is moving forward in time, that's very awkward when you have many spatial dimensions, you will be looking at something where the fields can exist in a finite volume and every solution will be point in this high dimensional space, it'll be fixed point. There is no Newtonian integration of PDs at all. I mean, this is how you solve it. And often that's what they actually do. So let me say it second time. We can do the same thing in D dimensions. So what happens in D dimensions, a cat sits here, but doesn't only care about what happened before and what happened after, but what are the cats doing next to me on left, right, front, sit. So there are lots of cats and they have to get all together. And you can very easily generalize cat model to a field theory. You just require that cat cares about its nearest neighbors in both directions. You want law of interaction with other cats to be always the same. The rules don't change from day to day. They should be same every place. So these are translation and uh, time invariances. And then we'll say one extra thing that's not necessary, but helps my exposition. Let's say that time is same as space. So I allow to interchange space and time without changing anything. When you do this, Goodkin and Nosipov get a very nice generalization of cat map. I'm at the site N in space and T in time, and I pay attention to the guy before me and uh, after me. And I get pay attention to the guy for, to the left of me and to the right of me. And I follow the orders I've been given. Once you think about it, you can see there's a beautiful way to do this because there is such a thing, it's called Laplacian, where you compare all your neighbors. You subtract our cat law and you get an equation, a Laplacian plus mass squared acting on a field being a source. And there is a relation between this mass, which is called Klein-Gordon scalar particle mass and the stretching rate and the dimension. And it's incredibly cool. I never knew that cat map, which for me was some ugly thing that the goddesses, you know, constructed with cats being cut, sliced and wrapped around. And it's actually just the Klein-Gordon equation in any dimension. It's beautiful, it's simple. The condensed matter is called tight binding or Helmholtz equation. In field theory, it's called Klein-Gordon applied math. It's called Tampasson. And the main thing is that when stretching S is small, the thing oscillates, so all solutions are sines and cosines. But when stretching is larger than two, everybody is hyperbolic, meaning everybody explodes exponentially. And that's the system we are interested in. So take home. The field theory that should describe chaotic systems will say that if the things are not very reactive, I'll have spring matters. But if things are very unstable, I'll have uh, cats running all over the place, and that's called Klein-Gordon. To summarize, we will now enumerate all possible solutions for larger and larger domains of space-time. The way we do this is we make sure that tangent space locally is what we are given, this differential relationships. But globally, everybody has to live in har harmony, and we can do that. Now, this is actually pretty radical because dynamics is dead. When we look at problems which are unstable, you should not evolve them. You should solve these global compact problems. When you want to give a name to a particular kind of cloud, we will not only track how it evolves in time, but we have to look at its neighbors. So if cloud lives in three dimensions, its name will be a three-dimensional block of symbols. I've shown you this for the one plus one dimension, Kuramoto Shivashinsk. I'm telling you that while in one dimension in time, there is something called periodic orbit theory, and this is a way of tiling past and future by repeat of the same solution in many times. In higher dimension, we should do this as we do it in condensed matter by finding tiles. To give you an image, in Kuramoto Shivashinsky, when I find spatially temporally periodic solution on one tile, if I repeat it, it'll be a regular tiling or all of the space time. And the way you think about this is that when you have nonlinear problems, it's not Fourier modes that are supposed to be tiling your space time. 
it's the solution of your equation. So these are non-trivial solutions. And if you want to describe larger and larger regions uh, more and more accurately, you will need more and more such solutions put together to uh, add them up. So bye-bye dynamics. There is no more time. There is only enumeration of admissible patterns, things that are allowed by the law. Time is dead. Forget dynamics. This is uh, an old fashioned thing. All these integrators my friends have developed, they can be junked. I'm sorry, they never worked very well because they only worked at the point of time and they couldn't do large uh, simulations of fluids accurately. They couldn't do it. And the clouds solved the equations as I tried to explain, not by integration, but by obeying them locally and making sure that everybody is well-behaved globally. 